insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Your hosts are Joseph and Madison Whalen, a father and daughter team making their way through the challenges of the teenage years. Welcome to Insights into Teens. This is episode 46, Santa Claus. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my brilliant and beautiful co-host, Madison Whalen. Hello. How are you doing today, Maddie? Okay. So today we're going to have a little bit of fun today. Cool. Um, no serious topics or anything. Uh, this is the last episode we have before we go on holiday break. Uh, we will be away for a couple of weeks. We'll be back in the new year uh, with our next podcast after this one. So this week we are talking Santa Claus. So before we get into that, uh, you had something special at school this week, didn't you? I did. You did last night. It was a holiday theme thing last night. Oh yeah, my oh, winter concert. That yes. Oh my god, I didn't know what you were referring to. That's okay. So you had your winter concert last night. Yep. And you play. You're in band, correct? Yep. And you play what instrument? The trumpet. And what songs did you guys do last night? Well, the first song. Um, well, the first part of it was the band, and the first song we did was our anthem, the Star Spangled Banner. Then, Very Christmas themed. Yeah. Then the eighth graders did a song. I don't remember the name. Do you remember the name? I don't remember the name. Neither no. do I. And then the um, drummers, the seventh grade drummers, did their version of Jingle Bells, which was that pretty was cool. That was kind of cool. I like that. Um, then the, all the seventh graders um, did Winter Celebration, which is a combination of... Deck the Halls, the first Noel, and we wish you a Merry Christmas. Right. That was very well done. Yep, and the eighth graders then did Sleigh, ba- sleigh Ride. Sleigh Ride, right. And then that was the end of our part, and then there was the four different, like, three different types of choir. Yes. That you had seventh the- grade concert choir, you had the after school concert group. And then the eighth grade. And then the eighth grade concert choir. I think they did fantastic. They did a, they did a really good job. Uh, their uh, choral director is very enthusiastic. I like that. Uh, but it was nice. It was a nice concert. It was about an hour and a half long. And, uh, you know, it sounded really good. You guys did a really good job. Thank you. So today we are talking Santa Claus. So we're going to talk about who Santa Claus is. We're going to talk about the origins of Santa Claus. Then we'll take a look at your prototypical shopping mall Santa. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about "Twas the Night Before Christmas," the poem from Clement Clark Moore. Then we will talk a little bit about Santa Claus around the world because Santa is a little bit different depending on where you are. And then we'll talk about some Christmas traditions in the U.S. And then we'll ask the burning questions: Is Santa Claus real? And do you believe in Santa Claus? And I think both of us will have a chance to answer those questions. Okay, cool. So, and then afterwards, uh, stick around because we have a very special holiday treat that all of our hosts have done for our audience. And we'll be playing that at the end of the show. It's only about a five-minute clip or so, but I think everyone will enjoy it. Mm -hmm. So are we ready to get into the holiday spirit? Oh, by the way, um, big thanks to Madison and Mommy, uh, Michelle, from our Insights in Entertainment podcast for doing the set decorations <laughs> that you see today to get us into the festive mood. Uh, you guys did a fantastic job with this as well, Thank especially you. digging out my 
Santa Darth Vader. Yeah, that was mommy's idea. That's awesome. So are we ready to get into it? Sure. All right, let's do it. So who or what is Santa Claus? Now, this definition comes from the History Channel's uh, definition at history.com. Santa Claus, otherwise known as St. Nicholas or Kris Kringle, has a long history steeped in Christmas traditions. Today, he is thought of mainly as the jolly man in red who brings toys to boys and girls on Christmas Eve, but his story stretches all the way back to the third century when St. Nicholas walked the earth and became the patron saint of children. Um, so it's a very storied history. Were you aware of that? Um, I was aware that there was some historical backstory towards Santa Claus, but I never really looked too deep into it. Okay. Uh, well, I think part of what we're going to do today is going to be kind of a deep dive into uh, who Santa Claus really is. And we'll start off by talking about St. Nicholas. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who St. Nicholas is? All right. So the legend of Santa Claus can be traced back to hundreds of back hundreds of years. Sorry, I can't That's speak okay. To Take your time. The legend of Santa Claus can be tracked back hundreds of years to a monk named St. Nicholas. Right. It is believed that St. Nicholas was born sometime around two, 280 A.D. in modern-day Turkey. Now, just to put that in the perspective, the Roman Empire was still around at that time. Yeah. So the Roman Empire didn't fall until the 500s. Yeah. So that's how far back... The concept of St. Nicholas goes, it's it's a real, you know, based on a real person. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more. Um, it is said that he gave away all his inherited wealth and traveled the countryside, helping the poor and sick. So that kind of gives us the concept of charity and giving and taking care of fellow man, right? Yeah. So what else do we know about him? Over the course of many years, Nicholas's popularity spread and he became known as the protector of children and sailors. I'm not really sure how the two of those are linked. Neither do I. Um, but sure, we'll go with that. Uh, his feast day is celebrated on the anniversary of his death, which... Why? Well, I, I guess they're very, very celebratory when you die. What day is that, by the way? September, December. December 6th. So we get a connection to... December and St. Nicholas and Christmas with that. Yeah. And what else do we know? He was traditionally considered... It was traditional... This was traditionally considered a lucky day to make large purchases or get married. And so there's another piece of the puzzle there. So December 6th, the feast day of St. Nicholas, was a lucky day to make large purchases. So even back in Roman times... We were commercializing St. Nicholas. Yeah. Um, so so St. Nicholas was a real person, and he really did exist. He had a reputation for uh, caring for children. Uh, there were several stories in doing the research uh, in which he would help monetarily. Like uh, in one case, there was um, a father who had two daughters and was very poor, didn't have any money. And he was going to have to basically sell his daughters off into slavery if he couldn't come up with money for a dowry. And, and back in the time, um, fathers paid dowries to suitors or to husbands to marry their daughters. And he couldn't afford to do that. And St. Nicholas swooped in, saved the day, paid the dowry for the, for the daughters, and the daughters wound up getting married off instead of being sold into slavery. So just another... Can I just say, both of those instances, if you would get married off or get turned to slavery, they both don't sound good? Well, they don't, but you have to understand, this is almost 2,000 years ago, too. Good point. So society was very different at the time. Yeah. So moving from St. Nicholas, we move into the concepts of Santa Claus. So we'll do that when we come back. Mm -hmm. 
So St. Nicholas made his first appearance in American pop culture towards the end of the 18th century. In December 1773, and again in 74, a New York newspaper reported that groups of Dutch families had gathered to honor the anniversary of his death. Uh, the name of Santa Claus evolved from the Dutch name Sinterklaas, a shortened form of St. Nicholas, or Sint Nicholas, which was Dutch for St. Nicholas. And in 1809, Washington Irving, a famous American author, helped to popularize the Sinterklaas stories when he referred to St. Nicholas as the patron saint of New York in his book, The History of New York. Now, an interesting thing to mention here also is that after the Protestant Reformation, which occurred in the 1600s in uh, England, um, that was when England switched over from um, Catholicism to Protestantism, and the Church of England comes into play later on. Okay. Um, Catholicism believed heavily in saints. Uh, there was a saint for everything, St. Christopher for this and St. this for that and, and so forth. So a lot of the Catholic religion uh, revered saints. And when the Protestants came into power, um, they thought that was sacrilege. Like you shouldn't worship these other people. You should worship God and, and Jesus and so forth. Mm -hmm. So as a result, the the Protestants came in and sort of did away with most Christmas traditions. Um, so by the time you get to 1773, a lot of what happens in the colonies and what happens in England, you don't have a lot of Christmas traditions there, but those traditions continued elsewhere, such as in um, the Netherlands where the, the Dutch live in, in Germany, they continued. Um, so, when we think of Christmas, Christmas didn't really exist the way that we think in, in England at this time. Um, it's not until a couple hundred years later that it sort of comes back to life. Mm -hmm. So moving on from Santa Claus, we get what we have today as what we consider the shopping mall Santas. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get back. So gift giving, uh, mainly centered around children and has been an important part of the Christmas celebration since the early 19th century. Um, stories began to advertise, uh, stores, stores, sorry, stores began to advertise Christmas shopping in 1820. And by the 1840s, newspapers were creating separate sections for holiday advertisements. Now, another interesting thing to note here is that prior to the 1800s, uh, Christmas was really more like New Year's than like Christmas. Okay. So it was a big giant party. You know, the famous song, 12 Days of Christmas? Yeah. Christmas lasted 12 days and it was a 12 day party. And people would drink and be merry and get drunk and get rowdy and... You had all kinds of problems. Imagine New Year's and you see how crazy New York City gets on New Year's. Imagine it being like that for 12 days. Good Lord. So what happened was in order to get away from that in the 1800s, um, you had people trying to take those traditions and turn them more towards family oriented things, making the holiday more for the children. Okay. And that led us into the commercialization of Christmas. Alrighty. So, um, in 1841, uh, thousands of children visited a Philadelphia shop to see a life-size Santa Claus model. Now, what does Santa Claus look like? Well, from then on, it was only a matter of time before stores began to attract children and their parents with the lure of a live Santa Claus. And Santa Claus was kind of a novelty at this point in time because you really didn't see a lot of them in publications or stories. He came out in some stories and stuff. Yeah. Um, 
In the early 1890s, the Salvation Army, which is a charitable organization, okay. needed money to pay for the free meals, the Christmas meals that they provided the family. So they began to dress up unemployed men in Santa Claus suits um, and send them into the streets of New York to solicit donations to pay for these meals. Okay. Which was kind of a creative way to turn uh, the Christmas idea into charity here. Mm -hmm. um, so the most iconic department store, um, Santa Claus, was Chris Kringle was what he was named. And uh, he appeared in the classic 1947 uh, Santa Claus movie Miracle on 34th Street. That's since been remade. Um, but that story involved a little girl who believes Chris Kringle when he tells her that he's the real Santa Claus. Um, the, uh, the Macy Santa has appeared in almost every Macy's Thanksgiving Day parade since then, since the parade began in 1924. Wow. And he's always the last one, you know, in the parade. Thanksgiving Day, we're up at, uh, G Miles, we watched the parade, and who's everyone wait for at the end of that parade? Santa. It's Santa Claus, right. So fans of all ages still line up to meet Santa in New York City and at stores around the country where children can take pictures on Santa's lap and tell him what they want for Christmas. Which, it sounds a little strange. You're going to go tell a stranger what you want for Christmas, but... Yeah, you know. honestly, I definitely think as you get older, the thing of... About Santa Claus, just the logic gets in your brain, and you're just like, okay, this is creepy. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I've definitely gotten to that stage. So when we come back, I want you to tell us a little bit about Twas the Night Before Christmas and how that got Santa Claus a little more defined for us. Alrighty. So tell us about Twas the Night Before Christmas. So... In 1822, Clement Clark Moore, uh, what is it? A minister. A minister wrote a long Christmas poem for his three daughters entitled A, Vis a Visit from St. Nicholas, more popularly known as Towards the Night Before Christmas. Go ahead. Moore's poem, which he, which he was in. Totally hesitant to publish. Initially, due, he was initi initially hesitant. Initially hesitant to publish due to the f frivolity. 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 Frivolity nature of his of its subject. It is largely responsible for a modern image of Santa Claus as a right jolly old elf, with a portly figure and the supernatural ability to ascend a chimney with a mere nod of his head. Although, oh, go ahead. although some of Moore's imagery was probably borrowed from other sources, his poem helped popularize the now, uh, the now famous image of a Santa Claus who flew from house to house on Christmas Eve in a miniature sleigh led by eight flying reindeer to leave presents for deserving children. A visit from St. Nicholas created a new and immediately popular American icon. In 1881, political cartoonist Thomas Nass drew on Moore's poem to create the first likeness that matches our modern image of Santa Claus. Now that image happens to look sort of like this. That's a colorized version of it. But in the poem, Twas the Night Before Christmas, uh, Clement Clark Moore talks about a ripe, jolly old elf. Well, Santa Claus these days isn't really an elf. And even in this picture, this early picture from the 1800s from Thomas Nast, he's not an elf here. He's a person. Mm -hmm. So the image of what Santa Claus is has evolved significantly over time. And what we have today is kind of a combination of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, so... His cartoon, which appeared in Harper's Weekly, depicted Santa as a rotund, cheerful man with a full white beard holding a sack laden with toys for lucky children. And that's really what we're largely stuck with today from our traditional sense of Santa Claus. Yeah. 
It's an ast who gave Santa his bright red suit trimmed with white fur. Uh, North Pole Workshop, elves, his wife, Mrs. Claus. So all of the narrative that surrounds the mythology and the story of Santa Claus kind of originated from Thomas Nast. And that was kind of a collection of a bunch of other stories, including Twas the Night Before Christmas. So it's kind of pulled together from different cultures. Mm -hmm. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about some of these cultures and we're going to talk about what this concept of Santa Claus is in these other cultures. So in the 18th century, America Santa Claus was not the only St. Nicholas inspired gift giver to make an appearance at Christmas time. There are similar figures and Christmas traditions around the world. Why don't you tell us about some of these? Okay. So Chris Kine if, sorry, I oh, still can't it. speak today. So, Chris, Chris Kind. Chris Kind or Chris Kringle was believed to deliver presents to well behaved Swiss and German children. Meaning, Chris, Christ Child, Chris Kind is an angel like figure often accompanied by St. Nicholas on his holiday missions. So, in Switzerland and Germany, Chris Kringle is kind of a companion to. St. Nicholas. And in other cultures, like for instance, in the United States, you get someone like a Jack Frost, who's kind of like a mischievous companion of Santa Claus who yeah. represents winter, right? Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about international Santa. Um, in Scandinavia, a jolly elf named Joltman. Joltman. Joltman was thought to deliver gifts in a sleigh drawn by goats. So there's some similarity there, and I don't I don't know if those goats fly. <laughs> uh, it yeah. would be interesting to see flying goats. Yep. Um, or flying donkeys, like in Shrek. I guess that would work, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, what else do we have? English, le English legend explains that Father Christmas visits each home on Christmas Eve to fill children's stockings with holiday treats. So now you have Father Christmas in England. Now, you'll notice that none of these really have any kind of religious connotation to them. So there's, there's that disconnect from what Christmas is and what the spirit of Christmas is here. Yeah. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we, we move on. What else do we have? Um, Pierre Noel, right? Yep. Is responsible for filling the shoes of French children. So... We fill stockings, they fill shoes. So again, it's another parallel that we have there. Yeah. In Russia, it is believed that an elderly woman named... Babushka. B B Babushka purposely gave the wise men wrong directions to Bethlehem so that they wouldn't find Jesus. So here is a religious connotation here. Now, you know, do you know who the three wise men were? No. Okay, really? so... The They're not... They're not the wise guys, they, though, right? They were not the wise guys, no. So in in the story of Jesus' birth, there are three wise men, um, often referred to as three kings. Um, they were probably merchants or landowners or something along those lines. They probably weren't kings because kings kind of travel with the whole entourage at the time. Yeah. It was Casper, Melchior, and Balthazar were their names. Okay. And the legend has it that they saw this star in the east, or was it the west? I don't remember which direction. <laughs> I, they didn't have GPS back then. Yeah. So they saw this star, and they traveled to the star, and the star was over Bethlehem, supposedly over the birthplace of Jesus. And it was a sign in um, ancient... Uh, lure of the savior of man who would come born under the star, et cetera, et cetera. So they came bearing gifts of frankincense, which is an incense, uh, myrrh, which is an oil and gold, which is gold. What kind of baby would want that though? It, these were valuable tradable items at the time. That's why people think that they were actually merchants and not 
kings. Uh, so okay, that makes sense. Kind of, Cause at the time these were spices, for instance, came from the East the, you know, you, uh, you've heard of Marco Polo. Yeah. <laughs> Marco Polo was famous for opening the trade routes to China to bring spices. Um, the oil was the same type of thing. It was a tradable uh, uh, commodity as was gold. So to us, they probably don't mean all that much. To them, they were very valuable. Mm. And you also take into account the story of Jesus who was born in a manger because there was no room at the inn and his parents didn't have any money, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody walks up with a pile of gold and really expensive gifts you don't turn them away. Okay, makes sense. So <clears throat> in this scenario, um, she gave them the wrong directions. So to finish, tell us about Babushka. Later, she felt remorseful, but could not find the men to undo the damage. To this day, on January 5th, Babushka visits Russian children, leaving gifts and at their bedsides in the hope that one of them is baby Jesus and she will be forgiven. Right. So in Russia, they celebrate Christmas on July, uh, January 5th. January 5th also happens to be the Epiphany, which we won't get into the religious okay. aspects of it here, but it's a religious holiday. So there is a religious connotation there. You don't have a... Santa Claus figure, but you still have this figure who shows up to give gifts. And what's the last example that we have? In Italy, a similar story exists about a woman called La Bafana. La Bafana, a kindly witch who rides a broomstick down the chimneys of Italian homes to deliver toys to stockings of lucky to the st into the stockings of lucky children. Now, that one sounds a little bit more like a nightmare before Christmas yeah. with witches on broomsticks. But you see the similarity here is that she comes down the chimney. So you have a lot of these stories that are different, but the same. There's a lot of parallels between them. A lot of things that Hello, are... Hello, universes. I wouldn't go that far, Just but saying. you have a lot of similarities because these are stories that are told over the course of hundreds of years and they're passed down from generation to generation and they all change a little bit here and there. You have different names, different methods, different transportation types, but all in all, it's the same basic story of once a year. You know, this, this charity and kindness to others, um, and this, 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 this human desire to, to want to have peace and love and, and giving for people. Yeah. Um, so it all kind of centers around what we like to call today, the Christmas spirit. So when we come back, we'll take a look at some of the Christmas traditions in the United States. In the United States, Santa Claus is often depicted as flying from his home, as, as flying from home to home on Christmas Eve to deliver toys to children. You and I both know that. Mm -hmm. He flies on his magic sleigh led by his reindeer. And who are they? Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, Don De <laughs> Donner here, yes. Donner, Blitzen, and the most famous reindeer of all, Rudolph. Now, you did stumble over Donner here because what we learned was that in the poem Twas the Night Before Christmas, it was originally where they were named. It was originally the name of Donder, not Donner. So <clears throat> we just talked about how the stories change across cultures. You get little bit of little differences here and there. Yeah. Well, this is one that stayed within the culture and it still changed a little bit from Donder to Donner. So that just sort of highlights how things change a little bit, like playing te the telephone game, you know, okay. passing messages from one person to another. Mm -hmm. So Santa enters each home through the chimney, which I never had a fireplace, so our chimney went right into our furnace, so I never could figure that one out. <laughs> but he's magical, so you're not supposed to figure it out. Yeah. This is why uh, empty Christmas stockings, which were originally empty socks would um now they're dedicated stockings made for the occasion are hung by the chimney with care in hopes that saint nicholas would be there as clement clark moore wrote in his poem 
Now, the interesting thing here is back in Victorian times, you would wash your socks, but you couldn't hang them outside to dry because it was too cold out. So you could hang them by the fireplace to dry because the heat from the fireplace would dry them. So that's where the idea of hanging stockings to get filled by Santa Claus came from. That makes sense. Yeah, see? So a lot of these traditions kind of have these make sense sort of ideas behind them. So the stockings can be filled with candy canes and other treats or small toys. Although I would not recommend filling them with chocolate if you're hanging them by the fireplace. Just, yeah, just don't hang anything that's meltable. That's probably a good, or good piece of advice. Santa Claus and his wife, Mrs. Claus, call the North Pole home. And children write letters to Santa and track Santa's progress around the world on Christmas Eve. Which you just got to say is also kind of creepy. Well, and there is an interesting story about that. So people track Santa through NORAD. NORAD is the North American Aerospace Defense Command. So this was a military branch of our armed forces that was set up back in the 40s and 50s, and it was a cooperative branch of military between the United States and Canada. And these were the guys who monitored all the radar and all the defense networks to find out if anyone was trying to fly over our country, namely Russia. So the way the story goes is Christmas Eve one night, uh, this guy who is an officer, he gets a phone call and it's a little girl who was looking to talk to Santa. And this was like a classified line that like only the president was supposed to have the phone number to. So he was shocked as to why, but he didn't want to disappoint this little girl. So he played Santa Claus you know, to the little girl on the phone because he didn't want to break her heart. And he said, oh, you know, I'm over so-and-so. You have to get to bed. I'll, I'll be to your house soon, blah, blah, blah. And he thought that was it. Well, before he realized it, the phone started ringing off the hook. And both he and all of his officers, all of his subordinates, were answering the phones and pretending to be Santa Claus. Well, it turns out there was a local department store who was running a promotion where you could call a phone number and talk to their department store, Santa Claus, and tell them what you wanted for Christmas. Well, it turns out the phone number that they listed in the newspaper was the wrong number. <sighs> and it was the number for NORAD. Oh, my God. So what happened was the following year, because the crew had so much fun doing it and they enjoyed doing it for the kids, they did it again. And again and again. And eventually they became an official job for Nora to do this in the Christmas spirit of things. Wow. So, so now you've got the entire United States Air Force, Nora, North American Aerospace Defense, you know, getting caught up in the spirit of Christmas so that they could give these little kids something, you know, to, to get their spirits going and the talk to Santa and stuff like that. It was a really cool story. Yeah. Um, so that's just another example of how, the story of Christmas and Santa Claus and everything else, it just sort of morphs and it gets picked up like that. And people get infected with what we call the spirit of Christmas. Mm. So where were we? At? Okay. So tracking Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. um, so children often leave cookies and milk for Santa and carrots for his reindeer. Well, you did that for years. Yep. Um, because you have to. We're, we're, we're good hosts. When you come to our house to visit, you know, just like Grammy, you should try to get us a, a, you know, a turkey. And here, I'll make you a steak. You're a good host. You want to make sure your guests are taken care of. Yeah. So Santa Claus keeps a naughty list and a nice list to determine who deserves gifts on Christmas morning. And parents often invoke these lists as a way to ensure their children are on their best behavior. Now, I have to say, growing up, my parents invoked that list probably starting sometime in September. And I got admonished over and over that, well, if you're not good, Santa's not going to bring you anything. 
And that was a motivating factor for me as a, as a child growing up. So I always had that in the back of my head. Nowadays, what do they have today? Um, he sits on a shelf. Oh, the elf on the shelf. The elf on the shelf. Good boy. Right. And the elf on the shelf has magical powers and he moves around the house and sometimes he leaves messages and it's different kinds of things. Yeah. Now it's just getting even creepier. But the, the point is, is that it's still yeah. this motivational factor that parents use to, you know, get their kids to be good. Honestly, I'm glad you guys never did that to me. Well, we just could not find an elf that wanted to take the job. That's all. Plus, well, I mean, in second grade, there was the one elf we did have. So, yeah. Well, you know, he was just a traveling one. He stopped over. Yeah. So these lists are immortalized in the 1934 Christmas song that you love, Santa Claus is Coming to Town, where he talks about checking his list, watching when you sleep, and all the other stalker creepy things that you're always commenting about. <laughs> oh, my God. So these are some of the traditions that we in the United States tend to enjoy but these are all traditions that have evolved over time. Even since I've been a kid, things have changed significantly. So that's the case that we make right now. That's the evidence, you know, as evidential as it is, that's what we have to make our case. So when we come back, we will ask the two burning questions that I'm sure our audience has out there for us. Mm. So I'm going to ask you first, and I don't want you to read from the notes because the notes are my answer. So I'm going to ask you first, and I want you to give me the answer in your words and your words alone, okay? Is Santa Claus real? In a way, yes. Explain. Um, if you think about it, the whole, like, the whole idea of... <laughs> The whole idea of Santa um, can make him real, like the idea of charity, the idea of giving, the idea of caring, kindness, all that stuff. Is But do I actually think that there's a quote-unquote jolly old elf that, um, that comes down your chimney, gives you presents once a year, and just flies off with his eight rain... Eight well, count him nine reindeer. He's only part-time, no. <laughs> so we can't count him. Well, yeah. Um, not really. Not really. Okay. So I will answer that question. Okay. So I wrote the notes for today's show. So I wrote the notes in a way to kind of support my argument. That makes sense. So here's my argument. Is Santa Claus real? Historically, yes, Santa Claus is based on an actual person who lived some time in the past. That's kind of a fact. Yeah. More importantly, Santa Claus is less a person and more a spirit or a philosophy. Yeah. Okay. Sort of like what you said. Generosity, charity, caring, love for all mankind. These are all what the spirit of Santa Claus really is. And there's enough examples out there, the NORAD example being one of them, where people get infected with the spirit of Christmas. And when that happens, and when you go from being your regular everyday self of just going about your business and being too busy to really care or get involved or, or help a person across the street or give to charity or whatever it is, when you cross that threshold around Christmas time and you drop a couple of toys in the Toys for Tots box or you uh, give some money to your local church or charity to help people in need around this time of year or you contribute to a food drive or whatever it is, when you cross that threshold to do these things at Christmas time, you are infected with the spirit of Christmas. And by definition, you are Santa Claus at that point, because that's what Santa is to me. That might not be that way to other people. Mm -hmm. Now, 
like you said, does that manifest in a jolly old elf with a round belly and a white beard? Maybe. Um, it's not really for me to decide, <clears throat> but to me, when, when you go out and spend your hard earned money, which you don't have a lot of, cause you don't have a full-time job and you spend that money and you buy somebody else a present, not because you have to, or because your parents made you, but because you want it to, because in the spirit of Christmas, you want it to brighten someone's day. When that happens, then that's you being Santa Claus. And that's good enough for me. And what I thought of Santa Claus as a child and what I think of Santa Claus now is different. So maybe Santa Claus manifests in each of us where once a year for a brief period of time, we can all put our differences aside and care for each other like we all believed at one time that Santa did. And we all get to be Santa. Um, and we get to allow ourselves to be infected by that Christmas spirit. So I will ask you, and I'm not going to uh, cut to a transition here, I'm going to ask you, and I think you've answered this, but do you believe in Santa Claus? Well, do I believe in a... Jelly no, no well, okay. don't break it down to that. Okay. Do you believe in Santa Claus? However you define it, do you believe in Santa Claus? Yeah. Yeah. So do I. And Santa is, means something different for you. It means something different for me. It means something different for everyone in the audience. But... I think all of us can believe in Santa Claus, whether or not he is this guy in a red suit. And I'm going to leave you with another story because I, we're almost done here. When I was about your age, it, it kind of got to the point where it wasn't cool to believe in Santa Claus anymore. You were kind of silly and childish. Your friends made fun of you for it and you wanted to fit in. So you, you didn't believe anymore and it was more peer pressure than anything else. Yeah. Um, and I got to that same point and Christmas Eve, one night when I was your age, it was, I don't know, we were in bed. I was in bed at like 10 o'clock and I couldn't get to sleep cause I could never sleep Christmas Eve. Even when I convinced myself that Santa wasn't real and I didn't believe anymore, I still couldn't sleep. Cause I knew there was going to be a pile of toys for me under the Christmas tree. Um, now going back when I was a kid, my parents didn't have a lot of money. Uh, we generally were kind of cutting the edge of poverty all of our lives. And the only time we ever really got anything was at Christmas time. And my dad, who I've spoken about on the podcast in the past was probably not the best dad in the world. Um, wasn't there all the time, had numerous flaws, but Christmas was his time. You know, it was almost like he knew he wasn't a good dad 364 days of the year, but Christmas time, that was when he got the shine and that was his holiday. He loved it. And he would like, like all good parents, he'd spoil his kids on Christmas. So I always knew there was going to be presence there. So I'm your age. I'm in bed. Can't get to sleep. All the, my other brothers, cause I have three brothers, they're all asleep. And I hear talking downstairs and I'm thinking, you know what? This is it. I'm going to catch them. I'm going to see them putting the presents out and I'm going to, this is my aha. I told you so moment. He's not real. And I, and I crept down the stairs and we had a banister. So when you walk down our stairs, there was a living room right outside the banister. And then around the corner was a kitchen. That was where my parents always sat. So I crept down and I peeked around and the tree was full of presents. So I was like, ah, I missed them. I didn't get, get down there in time. So I peeked around the corner and what do I see? But my mom, my dad, 
and Santa Claus. And this guy was Santa Claus. It wasn't a fake beard. Wasn't a cheap suit. This guy was totally legit. 100% real beard. Santa Claus, like out of the movie miracle on 34th street. And like, I was immediately terrified. Now, I don't know if my parents noticed me there or not, but man, I hightailed it up those stairs, got under the covers and did not peep a word until my parents told me to come downstairs. Years later, when I was an adult, I asked my mother about this. And to that day and to the day she died, she would not tell me who that was. I honestly don't think she knew who that was. So at 13 years old, Santa was real to me. And I have no reason to think beyond that, that Santa is a little guy as a, as a jolly old guy in a red suit with a white beard. But that Christmas Eve, that made me a believer. And I'm 40 some years old now, 45 years old now. And I'm still telling that story. Okay. That's how much of an impact it had on my life. So do I believe in Santa Claus? Absolutely. On many levels, but as a parent, I believe in it because I get to be Santa Claus. You know, mommy and daddy get to put those presents down there now. And we get to see that look on your face. That's a Christmas spirit. And that means a lot to me. So we're not going to have closing thoughts or shout outs today. We're going to leave you yeah. with, um, a little special project that we did. And, uh, hope you enjoy. Hope you enjoy. Happy holidays, everyone. The Night Before Christmas by Clement C. Moore Introduction In 1822, a New York clergyman named Clement Clark Moore spun together Christmas memories for his children. The poem he wrote featured a red-suited Santa and a reindeer-drawn sleigh, a never-empty sack of toys, and stockings hung expectantly above the fireplace. He called it A Visit from St. Nicholas, and it was then published anonymously in a newspaper in Troy, New York. It captured the public's imagination. The poem's opening line, "'Twas the Night Before Christmas, soon replaced the original title. One reason Moore's poem has endured is that it is a joy to read aloud. Beginning in hushed suspense, the poem builds to a traumatic crescendo as the rollicking verses usher the mysterious midnight visitor. A tale of anticipation and wonder. The night before Christmas has become a holiday tradition in itself for many families. So as you listen to this recounting of the poem, whether for the first Christmas or to recall those past, Celebrate and share the timeless joys of this enchanting holiday. T'was the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there rose such a clatter, I sprang from my bed to see what was the matter. 
away to the window, I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave a luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wandering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles, his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen. To the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. As dry leaves before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop, the courses they flew, with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas, too. And then in a twinkle, I heard on the roof, the prancing and pawing of each tiny hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur, from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump and a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. In a wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk. And laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim as he drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all! And to all, a good night. Ho, ho, ho.